Hi, I'm Aaron, and this is Exploring Elixir, where we look at interesting language features, libraries, and design patterns from the world of Elixir and the Beam Virtual Machine. In this episode, we'll look at one method to gracefully handle unexpected errors in our code's business logic. A lot of Elixir applications provide services over the network, and oftentimes these are done over long-running connections, such as a WebSocket or even perhaps a raw TCP uh, connection. So we're going to look at this toy example of such a service where we're providing the ability to pass in some JSON formatted data um, along with a key that we expect to be in that data, and it's going to return some transformation of that data back to us. And perhaps we're going to do this um, or provide this over a WebSocket to the user. So it's calling this extract function. Let's just quickly go in. I've already set up the JSON filter module. Let's go ahead and implement um, a function called extract. And it's going to take a process ID, some JSON, and then a key in that JSON to work on. Now, normally, if this is a WebSocket, we wouldn't be necessarily taking a process ID, but um, perhaps a, the actual socket itself or whatnot. But for our purposes, this will do. So we're going to check to make sure that the data we're getting in our parameters is what we want and need. I'm trying to write some, you know, reasonably reliable code here. Um, and so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use Poison, which I've already added to the project earlier, to decode the JSON into a native Elixir term. And then we're simply going to send back to the PID that called us, or the process that called us, um, the data associated with that key. Very simple, two lines of code, what could ever go wrong, right? So let's try running that. And we immediately get a bug. And this is a, a typical kind of bug if you've used Poison or similar libraries where uh, you might forget that it doesn't return just the data you've asked for, but it's actually returning an OK or error tuple. And it's the second uh, member of that tuple that actually has the data we're after. So now if we try this, OK, we're getting what we wanted. That's great and perfect. Now, such bugs can slip into production code, especially as it gets more complex. And you know we want to make sure that we can handle that. And especially if the jobs that we're running or the workers that we're running um, are using, say, external services that we don't fully control as well. So the world is not always in our control. So the problem is that when this failed here, if this had been running inside of our uh, WebSocket code, it, it, there's a chance that the whole socket connection would just also be reaped and, and, and close on us. And the client on the other side would then either get a uh, closed socket on them, and they don't know why, uh, they have to reestablish the connection, uh, or it might even worse, just hang around on them um, and you'd get no response. Additionally, if the WebSocket that um, the request came over and we started this bit of work going on closed because maybe the client is on a bad uh, mobile connection or what have you and they lose internet connectivity and the socket goes down, then our job would also be interrupted. And, and if we were trying to store this data you know, somewhere, perhaps durably in a database, we may not want that either. So it'd be really nice if we could separate failure in either the WebSocket connection or the worker that we're, we've got running here um, from each other so that a failure in one doesn't affect the other. And of course, in Elixir, we have a really nice primitive to do this called processes. So let's put the worker now in its own process. So we'll just make a, another function called extract data for lack of a better name coming to my mind. Um, and what we'll do here is we'll simply spawn a process that runs the extract data function and we'll pass in the PID uh, the JSON we, we received and the key. Um, and now this will run the same code, but it'll run it in a separate process. Now, to get the data back, we'll just write a really simple um, manual uh, receive block here. And what we're going to, oh, and not wend. And what we're going to look for is some sort of data coming back to us, being sent back to us from the um, the process. And actually what we're going to do is we're going to send uh, ourself as the PID to respond to. Because it's going to send back the message here, so we'll wait for it. And when we receive something, we'll send on to the PID we were given the data that we received. Great. So now we really haven't 
fix the problem. If, if this bug is fixed here, then this will work just fine for us. Great, we got our data back. But if there's a bug in here, again, if we return ourselves to the bad condition, this receive loop is not going to receive anything. It's just going to sit there forever, waiting on data that's never going to arrive. So maybe we go, okay, let's let's add a timeout here. And we'll say after, you know, one second, uh, if we don't get anything back, we'll just send a message to the person who called us and we'll give them an error. We'll say, you know, timeout, which is a sad event. But at least now, even when there's a bug, after one second, we get a very nice error timeout message. Fantastic. So now we're, you know, step in the right direction. How it would be nice not to have to wait for a second and maybe it takes more than a second. We don't know how long it's going to take. And what we'd really like to do is be able to respond on actual failure. So at this point, we may be tempted to do a spawn link and link the two processes together, our WebSocket process and our worker process. The problem with linking is that it does, well, link the two processes to each other. So if either of them fails, it's going to cause the other process to stop. And that's not what we want at all. We could say here, well, let's trap exit, setting the, the trap exit flag, and then write code to manually manage the, um, the responses. But what we really want to do is we just want to monitor the worker from the code that's being called here. So we can actually do that. And magically enough, it's called monitor. And what monitor does is it lets you watch the lifespan of another process. When you call spawn monitor, it's going to return a two tuple. The first of which is going to be the uh, PID of what has been spawned. So we'll call it uh, worker PID. I'm not going to actually use these values, but it's neat to see what um, we're getting back. And then it's going to give us a reference to the monitor. You can have multiple monitors on a single uh, process, unlike links, which you can only have one. Um, but that's not a problem for us because we're going to call spawn monitor. We're not going to call spawn itself and then call monitor on that PID. The reason for that is because there's an obvious race condition between these two. If we call spawn, the process might start and immediately crash or immediately complete its, its job before we get to call our monitor. So we use the uh, atomic spawn underscore monitor function just like spawn link, and this will guarantee us that we get a monitor back on whatever the PID is. Now we are going to get down messages whenever the process exits. This is fantastic. And, and the, the down message is a tuple as well. It returns the monitor reference, which we received earlier, will match up, the function that failed, the PID um, of the process that crashed, and then a reason, right? So. If this happens, let's send back to our caller um, the fact that we got an error, processing failed, and then let's just uh, tell them what the reason was. As simple as that. And now we should get an error back pretty much immediately. We don't have to wait for that timeout. Um, this is beautiful. So now we actually see we get a backtrace telling us what the error was and the processing failed. Now, we may want to take this a step further and actually receive all the data because maybe it doesn't receive, uh, come in all at once. So we'll take our, our manual receive block here that we've written. Um, let's wrap it in a little function. We'll pass in the PID to communicate back to. For response, PID, do. And when we get data, instead of just, it, we're not only are we going to just send that data back to our caller, but now we're also going to call um, our wait for response function recursively um, so that we can now do things in our worker like have a stream of, of uh, messages. So let's say we want to send back um, progress reports. So progress 50% or whatever. And then when we're done, we will send a progress of 100%. Wonderful. Now, if we run this, oh, a little bit of an error there. Ah, yes. Need to uh, provide the third term. No options. Good. So we got our error, but we got our progress message first, and then we got our error. 
So let's see what happens now if we fix our error, our little bug again. Oh, too fast. Okay, great. And then we get um, our progress and then we get an error message. And, and the reason it exit is normal. Okay, so what's happened is the uh, worker has successfully completed um, but it's giving, it's exiting and we're getting notified of that. Now we could here do an unmonitor of the process using the monitor reference we got, but we don't know when the last bit of data is gonna come in. So instead, let's also wait for an exit of just normal type, which means everything went well. It wasn't a failure at all. It was successfully completed. And let's give the uh, user the good news. And now if we run that, boom, we get progress messages, we get the data we wanted back, and the processing is successful. And even when there's an error in our code that may slip in later on, or maybe only happen one time in a thousand, the WebSocket, or if there's a TCP connection, or whatever the connection is, the caller is not going to uh, fail, they're not going to be unnotified. They're going to know that something happened wrong. It's best of all, it's not going to take the connection down because it's being written uh, or it's being run in a separate process that's running the extract data uh, function as a worker for us. So we've successfully isolated both of the processes from each other. Um, and you can imagine if this was, you know, a, a Phoenix channel or what have you, that we could, instead of having a receive block that we've written ourselves, we can actually turn each of these uh, clauses into individual um, handle info uh, met, uh, functions that would be looking for, you know, down messages or your data message. Um, and so you can run as many of these as well once you are once you have a gen server because you can just spawn off a worker. They can take a long time. Maybe it's doing some, some data crunching in the background or waiting on a third party service to respond to it. Um, and then maybe the client uh, asks for another job to be started and you can just spawn another worker. Uh, so this is a really nice way to not only take advantage of the multiprocessing that you get, um, you know, for free almost with, with the Beam, but it helps you separate or isolate failures and faults in one part of the code from the other. Um, again, if your socket was to go down, your worker would continue. So this is a really nice general purpose kind of pattern that I find quite useful um, when writing um, services in Elixir. Um, I hope you find it uh, useful as well. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them in the comments below and we'll see you in the next episode.